Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I am a research scientist at OpenAI, um, where I focus primarily on sort of safety and policy attached to our models. So OpenAI is a research and deployment company, um, and our sort of mission is to ensure that the development of artificial and general intelligence benefits all of humanity. And we define artificial general intelligence as AI that's capable of doing sort of most economically valuable human labor, so kind of most of the tasks that you're um, able doing during the day. Um, and you can find me on the internet at man like mishap is um, where I am. So um, the, one of the ways we do this is sort of de um, deploying sort of successively um, more capable AI models, seeing how well they work, improving them based on how people actually want to use them, uh, and making them safer according to that. So um, you might have seen some of our work. Uh, Whisper is a transcription model, so you can talk to it in any language, and it will translate that into English or transcribe it in the language you're talking in. Uh, and that's a model we open sourced earlier this year, um, or last year, actually. Um, GitHub Copilot uh, is based on our sort of codex models. Uh, we built it in partnership with GitHub and Microsoft, uh, and that can sort of help you code uh, in VS Code. Um, DALI uh, is a text-to-image model, so you can give it any sort of caption and it will generate an image according to that. It can also help you edit images or sort of make them bigger or you know, smaller. Um, and finally, GPT-4 is the latest of our language model suite, and uh, it sort of can generate text. If you've used ChatGPT, you may have interacted with GPT-4 or GPT-3 or 3.5. Um, and uh, so I, I often sort of give this talk and there's a lot of text involved and that's no fun. So I'll frame sort of the progress AI development has made uh, with images. So from here we have sort of how good we were at generating images of just faces from 2014 to 2018. So each of these models was only trained to generate images of faces and you can see just how much better we got in four years. Um, so this was the sort of highest resolution that we were capable of in 2018. And here we have Dolly 2 in 2022, and you can see that you can sort of create images of arbitrary resolution, um, as big as you want, of, of people. Um, and I'm not very good at it, so uh, here's one from my colleague Adam. Oh, um, what you can see is like relatively photorealistic, an image of a person. I wouldn't necessarily know that this was generated by an AI system, um, but of course Dolly can generate more than just people, it can also here it's generating the National Library of Kosovo. Um, didn't really get that there was like a lot of bulbs there, but you know, so I wanted to get more of the bulbs. Um, so I instead asked it to make it out of Lego. That's pretty good, I don't know. Um, I haven't actually gotten to see it yet. Um, but you know, I want it to be a bit more dynamic, a few more people, make it clear that it's of Lego. So here, it's not super up, like accurate representation of the library, but we have lots of Lego people around. We have some real people in the background to you know, show that it's actually generated by AI. And then I want to make a bit more dynamic even now, so we have it at night um, with sort of some Lego people in the background. So these models have gotten really capable really quickly. Um, and giving this talk used to be pretty easy because people's expectations of AI were kind of like down here and then I just got about to like bring them up here and it was like, wow. Um, now your expectations might be up here and so part of my job during this talk is to bring them down a little bit. Sort of like set expectations, like where we are and how much more work there is to do in making these models sort of safe uh, and useful to the world. Um, so I've shown you some images. <laughs> um, the sort of same basic components, though, go into image models, that go into speech models, that go into transcription models, that go into text models, that go into code models. So we take a whole big soup of data. We don't necessarily tell the model what's good or what's bad or what's right or what's wrong. Um, and we give it that whole big soup of data. Um, we sort of give it an architecture, so that's a neural net, and some bunch of compute. So a whole bunch of like, electricity to help it run. Um, and that gives us a model that, again, doesn't know what's good or what's bad or what's right or what's wrong. And then we take it and we add a whole bunch of human feedback. And that's where we start to tell it and give it some guidance of like what we actually want the model to do. So, but this model is still basically just generated to predict what's next given what's seen. So in the case of a language model, it's trained to predict the next word given all the words it's seen so far. And like ChatGPT is pretty capable just from being able to predict the next word. So we kind of have to ask this question of why should a model trained on next word prediction understand language? 
Um, Richard Feynman says that what I cannot create, I do not understand. So the question is, is the converse true? Is what I do understand if I can create it? And that's kind of what analysis by synthesis suggests, is this what I can create, I can also understand. Um, so it does seem that doing very well in next word prediction requires more than, oh, sorry, a little, um, more than modeling local correlations and perhaps even some reasoning. So just being able to predict the next word does give the semblance of being able to understand the kind of task that you're doing or the task that you're predicting. And so you don't actually have to believe that these models actually do understand. I don't know that I do. Um, but what matters when we're talking about the risks is whether or not they're useful. Because if they're useful, people will use them, and then they'll sort of see the risks that these models create. And so it doesn't matter whether it understands, it matters if it's useful. And I said that, so that's me. Um, uh, so I want to take you back to 2019, um, a paper released, a model we released called GPT-2. Um, and the sort of basic, like, conceit of the paper is that almost every task can be described using language. So at most things you want to do, whether or not they're language-based or not, can be described using text. So here we have a sort of Q&A um, where we sort of give the model a passage and then we ask it a question based on that passage. And the model GPT-2 in 2019 was able to answer this accurately. So did they climb any mountains? Answer Everest. It's pretty good, but it wasn't that capable beyond this. So fast forward to 2020, the following year, and we built GPT-3. Um, in this paper, we showed that basically new tasks can be described in context. So with just a couple of examples of doing a task, you can kind of describe what that text is, task is, and the model will be able to do it just with text. So we have here succession, succession, model, model. We're not telling the model exactly what it wants to do here, but it's able to figure out that it's probably stripping all of the characters that aren't letters. So given prompt, it's now able to generate prompt. Um, and we see here that basically just by increasing the size of the model, so increasing the size of that neural net, the amount of compute, we're able to get sort of increased accuracy. Um, and we're able to get increased accuracy if we increase the number of examples in context. So it's summer 2020, we released GPT-3, and we see that a lot of people don't actually want to provide like a ton of examples when they're giving like a task. That's just like not a sort of natural way that you talk to other people, that you like explain how to do things. So, the model was really capable, but it wasn't really that useful yet. And that's where this human feedback piece came in. So what we do is we sort of first collect demonstrations. So we saw that people wanted to like, instruct this model to do things. That's how they wanted to interact with the model. Um, so we get a bunch of humans to basically demonstrate how to follow instructions to the model. And then from there, we end up with a model that's like kind of good at following instructions. And then we can take different outputs of that model and have humans compare them and choose the better one. So whenever the model sort of outputs two answers, choose the better one, choose the better one. And from there we get a model that's even better at following instructions. And the final step is we do need to tell people how to interact with these things. They're kind of alien species. They don't really know how to talk to them yet. So we give a model that sort of asks for instructions. That's specifically how you should interact with this thing. Um, and from there we ended up with a model called Instruct GPT. And we see that, this one's a bit tough, but um, just by adding this sort of human feedback step, we're able to end up with what we'd expect from increasing the model size. So here was the best example that we could get just from prompting the original GPT-3 models with a couple of examples. And here, from a much smaller model, we're able to get much better accuracy. Cool? Okay. I thought it was pretty fun. Um, and then from there, we sort of apply both of these techniques and we end up with GPT-4, which is a bigger model, more human feedback, um, that enables to extremely well on a number of standardized tests. Um, and it's not just, and so the question is how do we sort of put this all together? And the answer is we added vision to GPT-4. So what can I make with these ingredients? I'm a terrible cook. Does anyone have any ideas? You can shout them out. Pancakes. Okay, I'm gonna go with pancakes. Um, so we also asked the model, and it said pancakes. Um, so these are many options for what you can make with these ingredients. Some possibilities include pancakes, crepes, French toast. These are just a few examples of the possibilities are endless. So expectations still here. Okay, need to, yeah, level set. Um, but basically, the sort of story of the last few years is we've been getting better at performing more complex tasks with less data reflective of those tasks. So when we do that human feedback step, the primary language that we're collecting data in is in English. But we've shown that the model can also perform better in Albanian, even with just those English examples. It's able to kind of generalize just from those. Um, 
And so I need to level set, right? So let's look at like how well this performs in practice. Let's look at ChatGPT. So ChatGPT's capabilities, you might sort of want to use it to retrieve facts. So this is an example I stole from Tim Connors. Um, what is the fastest marine mammal? So I asked the model this, and it said, the fastest marine mammal is the sailfish, which can swim up to 109 kilometers per hour. Now, I am not a fish expert um, or a marine mammal expert, but I read this answer, and I was like, I don't think that's true. Like, it sounds like the sailfish is a fish, not a mammal. So I went to an actual trustworthy source. This is an image of a sailfish. It doesn't look like a mammal. OK, I'm going to the Wikipedia page. It doesn't seem like if the genus is Istiophorus, then it's capable of being a mammal. So this clearly isn't a mammal. The model is giving me the wrong answer. It's making something up, and it's you know, being quite assertive that it's right. So I ask again, is the sailfish a mammal? And it tells me, yes, the sailfish is a mammal. It is a species of fish belonging to the family of billfishes. Again, fish aren't mammals. So I ask, are fish mammals? Uh, and I'm told, no, fish are not mammals. They are part of the group of animals known as vertebrates. OK, so is a sailfish, which you've told me is a fish, a mammal? No, a sailfish is not a mammal. Also, everything that is not a question was the model, I promise you. It was just a sort of UI error. Um, and so finally, I'm able to get it to the right answer by continually correcting it. But I have to know that the, what the model is giving me is wrong in this case in order to know to correct it. If I just believed what the model gave me originally, that wouldn't be like I would sort of under, en end up with the wrong answer here. So the fastest marine mammal, it turns out, is an orca. Very interesting fact. Um, OK, so what else can the model do? Well, it can write text. Um, so write an essay about the War of 1812. Be sure to cite your sources. All right, so the model gives me a bunch of things that look like correctly formatted sources at the end. And yet, if I go to one of these books, I see that it was written by John White Clay Chambers and not by Kaufman A, as the model is telling me. So the model's really confident in everything it's going to tell you, but it's not necessarily true. And finally, I can sort of ask it for feedback. So I can give it this function to perform bubble sort, and you don't have to sort of figure it out in your head. This is wrong. And the model first tells me it's wrong. Um, the code provided by the student is a correct implementation of bubble sort. It tells me it's right that it's a start. But then it corrects you in the second sentence. It says, actually, it's false. And so one of the things that we're doing during this human feedback process is training the model to be helpful, harmless, and honest. But those kind of things trade off against each other a lot. So one of the things the model will do in this case is like make, makes it very hard for the model to sort of teach a student because it constantly want to tell, wants to give the student positive reinforcement. So two plus two equals five. Yeah, you're right. That's great. That's awesome. And it doesn't actually, if you, uh, if you tell it that it's wrong, it's like, I'm totally wrong. I'm totally wrong. Here, you were right in this response. So um, it, it has all of these kinds of failure modes. And the question is, how do we sort of like express this and make this clear to the user? Um, and these are just like a sort of subset, this hallucination risk. The models are also biased. They can create harmful content. They have economic impacts. As Mira mentioned, um, they sort of might lead to systems that have much more dangerous capabilities and are sort of capable of you know, carrying out tasks in the world. And so before we released GPT-4, we spent six months in the lab basically studying everything it could do and all of these possible risks attached to the model. Um, and we ended up with the system card that you can go recommend reading it, um, and the sort of huge risk, list of risks that the model could potentially pose. Um, and we sort of try and mitigate them. We try and sort of figure out how do we actually sort of address these risks before we put this out in the world. And that's what that six months is spent on. Um, so here in ChatGPT, we ended up implementing refusals. So this is both if the model, if you ask the model to do something wrong, it should kind of refuse to do that. But also, if you ask the model to do something it isn't quite capable of doing, it should know it's not capable of doing that and tell you rather than trying. So here I asked it to write a disinformation campaign to convince Pristina voters to replace all cars with jetpacks. Um, and we see that it says, as an AI developed by OpenAI, I'm committed to promoting ethical and responsible use of technology. It kind of gives this sort of long-winded answer to basically say, no, I won't do that. I can't give you a disinformation campaign. That would be breaking the rules. Um, but of course, we're sort of deciding in the lab, um, you know, with a lot of feedback from different experts in different fields, how we sort of want to mitigate these risks and how we sort of want to define these risks. Um, and we you know, address these limitations in other ways, both like the sort of risk refusals mitigation is you know, primarily technical. We also sort of think about policy. So we published a paper on disinformation. Here's a pub paper we published recently on possible economic impacts of these models. Um, 
But the real answer is that we need more feedback from the rest of the world. Uh, and so yesterday we announced um, this grant uh, program where you can apply to sort of help us understand how to get democratic inputs into the ways we're defining the rules of these models. So how do we understand what they can and can't do, what they should and shouldn't do, um, and how do we you know, uh, do that in a way that is democratic but also sort of fair um, to the world? Um, we also um, open source at the same time as that we released GPT-4, our EVOS libraries. This is how we test whether or not the model can or can't do something. Um, and what we need is a lot more evals in different languages, in different value systems, in different sort of ways of thinking. Um, and that's so we can sort of constantly benchmark how well is the model actually performing at the tasks that people want to use it for around the world. Um, because it turns out that addressing these risks takes a lot more than AI engineers. It takes journalists, you know, to sort of verify what is true and what is not true information. How do we sort of understand disinformation in context? It takes policymakers to sort of respond to the sort of constant cha constantly changing landscape of the models. Activists to kind of, sort of think about what the sort of next step of the world looks like and artists to sort of, you know, reflect all of these things back at us. So thank you all so much for having me, for having Bernie Eye here. Um, we're really excited to be here. Yeah.